Human beings are flesh and blood, memory and hope. Human beings are flesh and blood, memory and hope. And gratitude is the muscle memory of humanity. Gratitude is the muscle memory of humanity. When we recognize all the things that we are blessed with, things we are grateful for, we're reminded of our humanity. So for a moment of silence here as we begin, let us give thanks for our family, for our friends, for our freedoms, for our community, for the abundance of food we enjoy, and oh, those fresh strawberries, the Mississippi River, beautiful music, good work, noble challenges, the common good, our sponsors, our speakers and presenters, our greeters and volunteers, our organizers, the terrible university, and the blessing of all the servants and leaders in our lives. Kierkegaard said that to be human is to think, thank, and remember. Think, thank, and remember. Most importantly, thank you to all of you for taking time out of your very full schedules and making the time to come together to join in this community as we all continue, as Robert Greenlee said, to seek as to what it might mean to build, as our founder said, a more perfect union, but a community of servants and leaders. I would just like, this is difficult for people to be kind of called out, but all the members of our, of our Masters and Servant Leadership Program and all of our graduates in Servant Leadership, would you please stand? Each of these people has blessed our lives and our community with who they are and how they serve. 20 years ago, this is our 20th anniversary of our master's degree in servant leadership, and when we first began talking about this, nobody knew who or what we were talking about. Called the Greenleaf Center in 1999 and said, can we use the term servant leadership? Is there a patent on it? Or, and would be infringing? They said, for, for what? And I said, we'd like to have a master's degree in servant leadership. I said, no one's ever asked the question. There was no masters in servant leadership, and so we, we began. They said, however, please be true to the vision of Robert Greenleaf. And so we have, and the people who have been in the program have embodied those principles and tried to live them out. So one of the things we'd like to do is that while you're here, consider it. Would you like to join us? We'd love to have you in our master's program. Is Robert Toomey here this morning? Robert? He's up there in the, in the balcony. Robert is one of our graduates and has put together an online certificate program in servant leadership. So if you want to bring this back to your, to your, to your communities or your organizations, we'd be more than happy because, we, as Michael Bush says yesterday, that this is the time for servant leadership, and we'd love to have you as part of our community. So again, thank you for being here as we begin another day. Our first speaker... James Bowie. Have you always been amazed when you think back to some of the things that you said yes to reluctantly that really turned out to be amazing? Huh? Some things that you were kind of reluctant, I, I don't know if I really want to go, and then it was better than what you thought, whether that be a party or a meeting or even a committee meeting or a conference. You know, things that we look back on and say, what did I say yes to? What did I say no to? Missed opportunities, we learned from those as well. So about five years ago, I was up in north central Wisconsin speaking at a farm. I'm on the farm circuit right now. <laughs> no, really, farmers consider me to be a moving speaker. I know, it's terrible. 
so I, it, it was women on the farm, and it was a, delightful. There was all these farm wives and farm women. And what's really amazing in terms of agriculture, you know, one time the farm was passed down to the oldest son. Now daughters are taking it on. It's a changing thing that's taking place in agriculture. It's marvelous. And I had a great day, and I'm driving home, and it's about 6.30 at night. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll get home, and my wife and I, maybe we can go out and get a hamburger or something. And, and I saw, I called Priscilla, and I said, would you go for a hamburger when I, when I get home or something? No, 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 meet me down at the public library. I said, I, I, I'm really kind of tired. I've given two speeches a day. I'm, I'm you know, really, meet me at the public library. I said, for what? There's really a great speaker. I said, have you ever heard him? No, but I heard he's really good. <laughs> a friend of mine called. I said, what are you talking about? Refugees. I said, wouldn't you want a hamburger? <laughs> so reluctantly, I thought, well, maybe I can get a hamburger after the speech. So I come into La Crosse, and I find a parking spot, and I get into the library, and the room's full in the bottom of the library. I walk in, and immediately, I see these amazing images of other human beings, refugees, fellow human beings. And the speaker is describing their lives with such honor and respect. I realized I was in the middle of a sacred conversation. Afterwards, I was anxious to meet our speaker, and they were closing the library. As they do, they flick the lights, and the library closes in five minutes. And here's this gentleman standing with his young daughter. I said, hi, I'm Tom Thibodeau from Viterbo University. I, um, I really want, I want to tell you how much I appreciate it. And I was I'm kind of going on, you know, trying to get all the words in in the next, last five minutes. And then um, I said, I think we could really work together. I, I said, what you're doing here is what we're trying to do in servant leadership of building inclusive communities. He said, well, when would you like to get together? I said, well, how about Friday? I said, sure. Well, here's my, and I gave my office number, my phone number. And on Friday, he shows up. And we had this marvelous conversation. And I bring him over to bring Rick. I said, Rick Kite's got to meet him. And Rick was in his office, and we went over, had this marvelous conversation. And I, I said, well, now you're going back to Winona, because he had mentioned how he had been teaching in Winona. No, I'm going back to Chicago. He had driven up from Chicago to La Crosse to meet me to talk about servant leadership. And I thought to myself, what commitment? Not to me, but to the work of building inclusive communities. James Boy is an AP photojournalist who has been around the world, sent out by the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, and other major news outlets in order to cover wars. And what he does is he begins to get to know people, and he brings back those marvelous pictures, much like our photojournalists are showing us what's happening in Ukraine. And then he came back and he taught journalism and now has been called to do the work of when home won't let you stay, recognizing the stories and the images of refugees, our brothers and sisters who live amongst us. And then his further work is how do we walk together to begin to understand each other. It is my honor to introduce you to James Bowie. Good morning. good morning. It is so good to be here. It is so honoring to be here. I um, have had the great privilege of standing in the wings the last day, and I know the group I'm in front of. And I know in many ways I don't deserve to be in front of this group, but I'm thankful to be here. So thank you for all being here to uh, listen to a few of my stories. I hope, uh, I hope they'll make a difference. I'd like to start by grounding us a little bit in the moment. Let's take ourselves out of this space that we've been inhabiting together and remind ourselves of our connection to the outside world. So I want to share with you to begin with a photograph I took uh, the day before yesterday. This is Lydia. She's an 18-year-old refugee from Ukraine. I was walking in the streets of Chicago and I heard the word Ukraine. And I stopped as I always do. 
My job, my life is to introduce myself to strangers and begin to learn about them and listen to them and learn their story. And so Lydia told me about um, what happened the night the bombing began. The first night of the bombing, she said, we were in complete denial. We had not expected that it would really happen. There was discussion about it, but we didn't believe it. Uh, when the bombing actually started, they thought it was a thunderstorm. And they even joked, oh, it's Putin. And it wasn't until the report started coming in that people were actually dying and that the buildings nearby were dropping that they knew it was for real. And by night two, she said, we were in shock. And we didn't know what to do. The home she was staying in got skimmed by a missile, took off a piece of the roof. And they waited till the next night. And on the next night, something amazing happened. Right there, she's sharing with me that on the third night, they started reaching out to each other, asking for forgiveness. They would say, we may not make it through tonight, but if there's anybody that I hurt, anybody that needs my forgiveness or who I can be forgiven by, please take it. I hope you make it through tonight and we'll be together again. She called it the night of repentance. Oh, humanity. This is Kenny. I met Kenny on a street corner at a food um, court. And I saw him, and I just knew there had to be a story. We got to know each other. And Kenny is a Burundian refugee. And right here, he's talking about uh, after he fled from the rebels, he got lost in the jungle and uh, left, was left alone in the jungle to survive for a year. He was completely alone with no human contact until after a year he was found by hunters and brought back to civilization. He talked about what that was like to be without any human connection for a year and not know what was going to happen next and how that made him and how that transformed him and his understanding. And these two stories that I share with you to start with are really the stories of people on the razor's edge of life, on the razor's edge of existence. And the reason I go after those types of projects and those types of stories is that when you talk and listen to the people on the razor's edge of life, you learn the wisdom of life. You learn the connection of life. And you learn it in a way that is transferable to everything. Their stories and their wisdom tells us how to be a better country. It tells us how to be better communities. It tells us how to be better organizations. It tells us how to be better families. And most importantly, and I think the, way I, the reason I do this work, is they teach us how to be better people. And so that's what I do. I go around introducing myself to strangers, diving deeply into subject matter, and I put together projects that I take out into the world. And I do typically large installations like this, a large interactive installation, or gallery exhibitions, or pop-up exhibitions, or even theatrical monologues. Um, I also bring together community to discuss and create opportunities. And then I also um, am always working on a variety of different subject matters. So the way I work is I get to know people. If I want to know a subject, the way I learn about it is to invest in people and to learn from people. And those then bring out the stories and the things that make those stories. And this is uh, a current project that's now touring called We Can Walk Together, which is what I'm using to name this talk today about race in America. And after the killing of George Floyd, I felt that I had to do something. And so I began reaching out via Zoom and then taking walks with people in their communities. And so for the last couple of years, 
I go out and meet people at their home, and we walk, and we talk. And in that process of walking together, we learn about each other and talk to each other and grow together, I hope. So today, guided by sort of my mission, which is that in my opinion and in my work, what I believe is that stories are the bridge between what is and what could be. And that that's the reason we tell stories and the way we learn from each other is to learn particularly what could be. And that's what I'd like to share with you today in this talk. We can walk together embracing the stranger in divided times. What I want to bring out through these stories is a sense of what is connection? Why are we divided? And what could be? And we'll talk about that and hopefully have some opportunities to talk together uh, when I wrap that up. So I'd like to begin with a little bit of a prologue. About a year and a half ago, a stranger showed up in our neighborhood in the Streeterville area of downtown Chicago near the iconic water tower, if you're familiar with that. And one day, a man appeared, 20 years old, 25 years old, and he was walking the neighborhood. But he started to get people's attention. He started to get people's attention because they knew he wasn't from there. He dressed in the normal outfit of a man his age. He had baggy jeans and high top Nikes and a pullover hoodie. But there was something about the way he ambled about and loitered about that really caught people's attention. And also, of course, and has to be said, for all of us to be honest in our own bias and our own attitudes, he was a black man in an affluent area of Chicago. And that caught people's notice. And for one of the most liberal areas in the city and one of the most liberal areas in the country, no one would dare say a word, but they thought it. And I watched as the elderly women with their Bichon friezes would pull them close and look out of the corner of their eye. Who was this man? And why was he in our neighborhood? And in a way, that sums up what is happening for all of us, is that we are always living a life in which division is percolating below the surface. It's a part of being human. That we're naturally looking at who belongs and who doesn't, who is us and who is them. And that process is what it is to be creating community, what it is to create organization, what it is to create justice and freedom, is we have to do that in the context of understanding that that issue of belonging is always just below the surface. And I think for many of us, while we talk about these issues and have often talked about them in the abstract, I think recently we're in a bit of an age where we're all feeling that division. We may not be experiencing the division, but in a really profound way, the people that I talk to, we're feeling it. That something has shifted. Shifted in the conversations that we have with trusted friends and trusted relatives. Shifted in what are the boundaries of discussion at work or with your friends. And that we're all a little bit uneasy about where is that connection that we took for granted and how do we reestablish it again. So that the division of the world that we often look at in news has become personal. And today we want to begin to try to break that down. And we begin that process by starting to recognize our divided times. But as always, I'm going to begin with a story. This is Yatha. I met Yatha in North Minneapolis, where he was staying on someone's couch. He's a Karen refugee. And this is the story he told me. As a little bit of background, 
I sit with people for long periods of time, often in multiple sessions, and I interview them and create long transcripts. And from those transcripts, I go through and I look for what I consider to be found poems, these little distilled moments that are open-ended, but yet they have this resonance, this human resonance that says it all. And this is what Yatha told me. He said, I was beaten and tortured by six people. I was bleeding from my ear, my eyes, and mouth. Around 11 p.m., they took off my clothes and threw me in the river. I was floating unconscious all night. There was one girl who witnessed what had happened. My body was found about seven in the morning. The whole village thought I was dead. I survived. What is so striking to me about that story is not just the pure brutality of it, and what he survived, and the trauma that he still endures today. But there's a little other moment, a passage in there that I'd like to call your attention to, and that is the one thing he sees and remembers is that girl, the girl who witnessed what happened. And I think a lot about her, what that must have been for a young person coming of age, considering what the world is all about, and to see that, and to try to make sense of it. But in that same way, we're all that witness. We're all that witness to things that are so beyond our understanding and so beyond our control that most of us respond by simply turning them off. That it's just too big. It's too far afield and just too huge for me even to get my head around. But that act of being witness becomes the thing that we're called to. And that how can we all respond? How would we respond is that girl by the river? So I want us to reflect on that a little bit while we introduce this number. Two weeks ago, the UN updated the number of displaced people worldwide to over 100 million. Today, as we're talking, there are 100 million forcibly displaced people in the world. If forcibly displaced people were a country, they would be the 15th largest country in the world, just beyond Egypt. When I started this project on refugees, one of many projects, the number was 65 million. And that's only three years ago, four years ago. It has been rising at the rate of about 8% a year. The early projections five years ago is that we would get to 200 million by 50, 2050, which was staggering to think of. But we're far outpacing that. We'll easily hit 200 million this decade. Refugees will soon be one of the largest countries in the world. 100 million people means 100 million people living in tents. It means 100, people, 100 million people fleeing life-taking violence. And this is going on around the world. Four, four million people recently displaced from Ukraine. Two million people displaced in Ethiopia. Hundreds of thousands of people displaced right now in Sudan from famine. That all of these things come together and we should process them in terms of division. But they're also taking place within another context another human context that I want to bring your attention to as well. And that is this. At the same time that we see these large global divisions happening, there's another type of division happening. This pyramid of divisions that I've put out for you. Divisions of gun deaths on the increase. Opioid deaths increasing to the point that for the first time, the life expectancy in this country has plateaued and gone down. The economic inequality 
has wrecked people. That we have more, we have come out of the pandemic with more inequality than we went into it with. Political polarization that we're all very familiar with. This we're the most politically polarized we've been since Reconstruction. Teenage mental health. The rate of depression and anxiety among teenagers has skyrocketed. And skyrocketed doesn't really put it into terms. For example, in my reporting, the Lurie Children's Hospital in downtown Chicago, one of the best children's hospitals, if you want to get a return phone call for a psychiatric appointment, it takes a year and a half to get, the, uh, to get the phone call back to schedule the appointment. That demand has far outstripped supply. And then lastly, on this little tidbit I'd leave you with, is decreasing friendships. That we're all at the, 50% of people in the most recent survey, just over a majority, say they have less than three friends a dramatic increase, a dramatic decrease from 30 years ago. And you may ask, why am I tying together the war in Ukraine, economic inequality at home, and friends? And the reason is simple, that they all are a loss of human connection. That what ties all of these events together that sometimes we lose sight of it by looking at the big macro event, by looking at those issues, we lose sight of the fact of the environment that we're in. And they're both changing in the same way. And they both represent the same thing, that there's a loss of human connection. This is Reagan. Reagan is a young mother. She lives in the south side of Chicago. Uh, when I met with Reagan and we took a walk together, Megan was carrying a gun because of the amount of uh, street shootings that had been going on in her neighborhood. And so for her protection, she wanted to keep that close by. As we walked and we talked, she told me the story that it happened about a year before. She was the mother of a newborn. And after her newborn had been home for a while, she started to get these chest pains. And she just could not make sense of them. They were excruciating. And she was having trouble breathing. She had massive chest pains. And so she called the ambulance. Reagan is a 911 dispatcher. She called the ambulance. They came and they arrived. They came to look at her, and the first reaction of her white ambulance driver was, haven't you called us before? She says, no, I've never called the ambulance before in my life. As a matter of fact, I, I'm too cheap. I would never call the ambulance unless it was an emergency. And she looked her over, and she said, you know, you're just having an anxiety attack. You can't be calling the ambulance all the time. You people are always calling the ambulance. And she started to feel awkward about it, as we can imagine. F started to feel apologetic about it. And so um, the person, the, this ambulance driver, she just uh, took what she had to say. She said, you're having an anxiety attack. Um, to get some rest, and you'll be fine in the morning. She took her advice. She went back into her home. But the pain continued and got worse and got worse. So she crawled out and got in the car herself and drove herself to the emergency room. And upon arrival, the physicians took one look at her and rushed her into emergency open heart surgery. She had ruptured her, one of her arteries had ruptured and they were able to catch it in time, perform emergency open heart surgery as she had had a massive heart attack. And she says to me, you know, the thing that scared her most is she just wanted to be there for her children. Imagine having to prove your worth, having to prove your seriousness, having to prove your belonging, that you're worthy of what we all want.
this division that we're wrapping up into many, many, we're taking many, many parts and we're wrapping it up under the big umbrella of division, I think for us today has a, a particular nature, if you will. It's a bit different than, uh, and has a particular unique quality of division, I think, for us to understand in the world today. And that is this, that our division is really atomization. That many of us, depending on when you grew up, who might understand the conflict of East and West as embodied in the Cold War. Red, blue, the big, the big ideas, the big ideas of what democ democracies versus communism, the big divisions. But increasingly what's been happening is those divisions are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And particularly those divisions are happening around identity. And as identity forms division, the divisions get to the point of being atomized to the level of individual human beings. And that's a particular nature that we have to be aware of. And where we see this manifest is when you look around and you see how quickly the coalitions change. Think of how quickly things changed around COVID. At first, we came together as community to help each other as we shut down and to help each other as neighbors. And then remember how it morphed? And then suddenly it became an issue about how serious is COVID? Do we need to mask on COVID? What do we have to give up on COVID? And very, very quickly, what had traditionally the galvanizing ability of national cooperation quickly changed to something else. That our alliances, our identities are highly fungible. And they're highly fungible because they're individualistic and they change quickly. And in particular, they're changing around a moral divide. That what is being discussed when you listen to those changing permutations is discussed in moral language. Think of the language of COVID. On both sides, people were f arguing of it from a, pers from a moral perspective the freedom to choose your own path, to choose your own health care, versus the responsibility to others. But what's important about that is when you have an atomized world speaking in terms of moral division, you're creating something that becomes existential. And we see this all the time, and it gets played out. For example, this 2016 study that has remained true, and the percentages have changed, so I use it here, which is when they said 40% of Republicans thought that Democrats are more immoral. That as a condition, they're immoral people. And of course, Democrats thought the same of Republicans. And as I said, this is important because when we put things in terms of moral divide, we're putting things in existential terms. Our moral connection, our moral standard is the thing we hold on to the longest. And that when that is threatened, it's an existential threat. And that's why we see the divisions that we do. But in short, what I think this means for us today is that we've become strangers to each other. That that common language, that common sense is being lost that it's more difficult to say that, oh, I know everybody will feel this way about that because we're Americans, or we're Wisconsinites. But I think all of you would agree that that's very, very difficult to find, that increasingly we are strangers to each other. So back in Chicago, our visiting stranger was getting a lot of attention. He was particularly getting attention because his behavior was becoming more and more erratic. He was walking down the middle of the street. He would sometimes stand awkwardly in the middle of the intersection. People would find him staring at trees. A woman in our building called the police when she, he was walking behind her on the same block and it got her worried. But I got worried too. Because as, as I watched him, I was watching somebody who was clearly struggling. 
And I knew that as a black man in an affluent neighborhood, things can go south very quickly. And I was worried for him, and I was worried what might happen to him and who he might get caught up with. I'd see him coming and going at different hours of the night, and I was worried what happened. And of course, the ladies with the Bichon friezes were on high alert. And when they would see me even talking to him or, or nodding to him, they were definitely starting to look at me too. But that's what we do, right? That's what we do. We try to make sense of who's in and who's out. But I think in all of this, I want to just bring us back to a bit of a landing point and share with all of us um, the wisdom of William Butler Yeats and that beautiful, his beautiful poem, The Second Coming, when he talks about the, when the falcons have lost sight of the falconer. I think your falconer can be whoever that is for you, whatever that is for you. But when the falcons lose sight of the falconer, the center cannot hold. And what we're describing in our lives today and the divisions that we kind of just move along with and kind of nod about, we have to understand that that cannot hold. That it is not practically or morally sustainable. It cannot hold. We cannot sustain this level of division, this level of inequality, and this level of threat for long. So let us try to understand. This is Ayan. Ayan is a refugee from Somalia. When I was 12 years old, I wore my best dress like we were taking a trip. But fleeing means you let go of everything you can't carry. First it was the photographs and clothes, then the food and water. You get to the point where you can only carry yourself and death would be better. Somehow you continue. In speaking to Ayan, she emphasized this point. She really thought they were going on vacation. She wore a yellow dress with pink flowers that she loved. And of course, if you've traveled with a young child, as I know many of you have looking in the audience, they love to bring all their stuff. So she brought stuffed animals and photo albums and things. But uh, within minutes, within hours, she knew they were in trouble and they had, to start, they had to start getting rid of things. One of the first things she had to get rid of was her dress because her dress as a young woman made her vulnerable to attack by people on the roads. And over the course of the coming days, when they walked hundreds and hundreds of miles, they had to let go of everything. So as she slays it out, you start letting go of the heavy things. Then you let go of the things that you need to survive. And there's a big choice to make between water and food. You need water to survive, but you're also going to need food, and it's going to be very hard to find. So what can you carry? But what she leaves out of this story, and what she told me later, was then you also end up having to make the decision of who you have to let go of. And she tells the excruciating story of people having to let go of the people they care for because they simply cannot walk. They cannot stand themselves. And mothers letting go of children on the road. In her own family, a cousin they had to let go. Imagine what it is to let go of everything in life, including the people closest to you. When you can imagine that, you imagine humanity at its purest. Imagine letting go of everything. But she teaches us. They all teach us. And what they teach us is, is to begin to think about and reassessing how we do understand each other and how we misunderstand each other. And one of the cultural touchstones that we've all relied on that I think creates some of the most misunderstanding 
is the concept of man as the reasoning animal. That what separates human beings from the rest of the animal kingdom is our ability to reason. It's what's embodied in the, in the Enlightenment and Cartesian notion of I think, therefore I am. It's the root of how we think about ourselves as being self-governing. That as rational animals, we have the ability to self-govern. It separates us from everybody else. It gives us a certain moral worth that the rest of the world, the rest of the animal kingdom does not have. But current research, contemporary anthropology, social science, social psychology tells us a very different story. That in fact, human beings are not rational at all. Human beings are only rational 5% of the time. Now, I know that applies to me, but I'm not sure. You might find it surprising. My wife knows it's true. The, but 5%. Because we are not reasoning animals. We're social animals. We are social animals. And what that means is that from an evolutionary standpoint, reason did not develop to enable us to solve abstract logical problems. It developed to live and thrive in collaborative groups. Whenever you're faced with a subject of reason or a subject of analysis, remember that. We don't reason. We exercise and navigate social groups. And the way we do that is through identity. Identity is the fundamental psychological factor that allows us to navigate the world between ourselves as individuals and the group we need to survive. That we maintain a sense of self while also being inextricably connected to something greater than ourselves. And we are in that constant process of rationalizing and making sense of that relationship so that what groups we identify become factors in how we act. What groups we identify with become factors in how we think. And we do it in a way that makes us maintain our own sense of self while also being connected to other people. One of the great ways of illustrating this is the toilet bowl fallacy. If you ask anybody in the first world, how does a toilet work? Everybody, or say, you ask them, anybody in the first world, how does a toilet work? Or do you know how a toilet works? They say, sure, of course I do. And then you ask them, well, explain it. And most people can't explain it. What's going on in that, of course, is no, we can't explain it. I don't really know the physics of how the toilet works and how the water goes through and what actually happens with the plunger. But we rely on that information. But with identity at work, we think we actually know it our identity. But we've actually come to that confidence because we've been enculturated by our group. We live in the first world. We use a toilet every day. They make sense. So we're always in this process between what we know and what we identify with. And they're not always the same thing. So this is our greatest strength and our greatest weakness. It's our greatest strength that is social creatures who don't have particularly big brains, don't have particularly great memories, don't have really good senses, aren't very strong, have managed to build civilization, build universities, medical institutions, that we have solved grand global problems, all because we're social. And we share that information and construct that information socially. But it's also our greatest weakness. Because that knowledge that comes to us comes socially. But we think we thought of it ourselves. And the certitude of that, the identity of that, leads us often to problem. And the particular problem is us and them. Us and them allows us to 
maintain our allegiance to a group, assert our identity, but it also keeps the other at bay. It makes the other stranger. And again, our, we are always navigating the social group. So our perceptions, our interpretations are determined by our experiences, our concepts, and our group identities. Remember that in mind if you would. Our perceptions are determined. Not we perceive, no, our perceptions are acted upon. They are determined, particularly when it's a zero sum contest. If the feeling is it's zero sum, if it's existential, if there's a winner and a loser, we rely increasingly on the social to the, to the complete abandonment of individual reason. I call this concept identity math. There's famous studies about what happens when you give people mathematical problems, but change the identity factor. One of the more famous ones is an example of the effectiveness of cold cream, where mathematicians were given the data on the effectiveness of a cold cream and given the numbers. And they went through the numbers and they determined that in fact the cold cream was effective, which was true. Then those same people were given the same exact numbers again. They went through the numbers, and when they were told that those numbers actually were the effectiveness of gun control, they came up with different answers with the exact same data. Identity math, what we identify with, determines perception. People accept or dismiss information regardless of its accuracy based on whether it supports the larger truth held by the identity group. And it's not just those guys, it's all of us, because we're social. Part of being human, then, is the capacity to ignore the suffering of others. Whatever's outside of that purview doesn't affect me and doesn't get my attention. This is Aaron. Aaron is, uh, lives on the south side of Chicago. He's a pharmacy tech. When I met with Aaron, we were taking this picture, he said to me, I love being a black man, but it's very tiring. A few days before we met, he'd been pulled over by the police, and um, they started questioning him about the clothes he was wearing. Aaron likes to dress nice. He earns his money, he earns his keep. But when they asked him to step out of the car, he had his really nice clothes on. They're saying, what do you, how did you get those clothes? How did you get those clothes? Imagine what that is. That you're not worthy? That your competence is questioned? He says, always having to prove myself is tiring. I love being a black man, but it's tiring. How beautiful and how human. But imagine again fighting for that belonging and what that is for everyday people. Every person in this project on race, every single person, has told the story of when their parents gave them the talk about what to say if they ever get pulled over by the police. Every single one. Did you ever get that talk? I didn't. Every single black American gets the talk. We don't. What is privilege, you ask? Never having to get the talk. Never having to have your fashion questioned. In America, we lost this sense of the common language. We talk about language. Language, oh, so often is weapon. One of the things we don't recognize and don't uh, own up to in this country is we lack a common definition of racism. For white Americans, racism is if you put a cross in someone's yard and set it on fire. Racism is what racists do. Racism for black Americans is something very different. Racism for black Americans 
is about a system that makes you have to fight for your belonging. And we're all in that system. So as social beings, we have a primary regulating mechanism, and that's loneliness. The way we keep together a people whose survival is based on being social is we have the feeling of loneliness. Contemporary um, psychologists and psychiatrists who are studying this area said that loneliness acts on the human organism the same way as hunger does. As hunger tells us we need to eat, loneliness tells us we need to get back in the group. And it evolved to become a very part of who we are. And so loneliness plays out in everything we do. But an important thing for us to keep in mind is, is that we have this sort of narrow definition of loneliness. We think of loneliness as being primarily what you know, young girls in junior high are when they're writing in their diary. Or we think of it as our older populations and what happens when their friends and relatives die off. But contemporary neuroscience, supported by contemporary psychology and social psychology, has begun to define loneliness as something quite different. And that loneliness is a much, much broader experience and is defined more as a sense of being alone in a crowd. It's a sense of alienation. It's a sense of loss. It's a sense of that disconnection from belonging. And in that sense, loneliness affects far, far, far more people. That loneliness is part of who we are and something that we can all relate to. And also, most importantly, is loneliness is a reaction to the environment. Loneliness isn't just a unilateral state of mind. Loneliness is primarily a reaction to your environment. What's going on? What's happening to all the connections in your life? When all of your grocery shopping is ported over to delivery, when your company goes entirely online and you don't see as many people, you don't connect with as many people, what starts happening? What starts happening is loneliness. And when loneliness lasts for a period of time, it becomes a pathology. Because loneliness is a systemic indicator. It's going on in your system. And those system, those health system reactions are dramatic. That the body treats loneliness as a stress. And it responds as a, with a stress response. So cortisol levels are increased. They're increased over time, which puts you at much higher risk for all of the typical things from hypertension, to blood, to uh, heart attacks, heart disease, cancer, et cetera. In fact, it has been itemized that loneliness is the equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. That loneliness is, in fact, become recognized as its own health malady. That loneliness is not the result of a health issue, but that loneliness is the foundation of the health issue. And people who are thinking about that are thinking about, about loneliness as a fundamental condition when not checked is a threat equivalent to 15 cigarettes a day. And we are in a loneliness epidemic. In a recent study by Cigna Insurance, more than three in five Americans, 61%, say they're lonely. This is Salwin. After my father was jailed and beaten, we fled to Thailand. We lived in a tent along the border for 25 years. We moved whenever the Burmese military came across or the Thai police raided our camps. A refugee is someone 
who cannot depend on anyone. A refugee is someone that cannot depend on anyone. Imagine the trauma of that in the context of a social animal who is lonely. Imagine the trauma of that for a social animal who is lonely and a refugee. Imagine the fact that there are 100 million people experiencing that today. And when you imagine that, you begin to understand a little bit of this, which is that while loneliness is experienced personally, its impacts are social. To put this more precisely, loneliness is a social problem. And all of the research tells us the same thing. That loneliness is not an individual issue at all. It's a social problem. Because we're social beings. And we spread it. And the reason to begin with that it's a social problem is when people are alone, they become more aggressive and divided. Loneliness is not the passive reaction that we think it is. For some, it is. But loneliness is an agitated state. And when people are in an agitated state, they can produce all kinds of different behaviors. First of all is oftentimes a loss of shared reality. They can't connect with what other people are thinking about. The other thing that has been found in research is a direct connection between loneliness and violence. There is a causal connection between loneliness and certain divisive behaviors. And most importantly, loneliness spreads. In fascinating research, of loneliness in a network of human beings, that loneliness spreads very much the way obesity does. I shouldn't use the term spread, and, and I'm not qualified to do that, but for all the public health people in the room, they know that there's a connection that if you have a friend who is obese, it increases the chances that you will be obese. And that goes off a couple factors of people. A friend of a friend is obese, you are more likely to become obese. The same is true of loneliness. In fact, what they have found is the loneliness at the margins makes its way in to the community or to the population. So when we have marginalized people, lonely people, it affects all of us, that loneliness spreads. And while that may not mean that we act out, it does mean that we are more lonely. And that loneliness is a consideration for this, we are divided because we are lonely. We are not lonely because we're divided. We're divided because we're lonely. For 50 years, we have reduced human contact over and over and over again. We have sought more and more privacy. We have sought more and more convenience. We have sought more and more efficiency that creates more and more loneliness. And it's tearing us apart. We found out they execute soldiers in village who helped Americans. We walk for days through the jungle. We hide and we make bamboo raft to float across Mekong River to Thailand. Everything is hard for me. My English is not good. I don't have much friends, but I can get my children a better life. Do we need more, any more inspiration than that? I can get my, my children a better life. 
Hannah Arendt understood very well the problem of loneliness. As a matter of fact, for those of you who are familiar with her work, one of her seminal volumes of work, the political theorist Hannah Arendt, writing in the mid 20th century, wrote this famous book, The Origins of Totalitarianism. An accompanying essay that she had written close to the same time eventually became the last chapter of her book on totalitarianism, where she makes the case that the reason that totalitarianism spreads and is successful is because people are lonely. And she lays out, and you see in this quote, that what happens is, is when the borderline experience, usually suffered in certain marginal social conditions like old age, becomes the everyday experience of the ever-growing masses of our country. Loneliness spreads. And her work discusses this in quite detail about what happens to the human mind, how you become manipulated, how alternative realities become more persuasive, how you look for other opportunities to connect with people that are also and oftentimes dehumanizing. And that this is a natural outgrowth of loneliness. So through the loneliness lens, we begin to get a little deeper understanding of where is this conflict coming from? And what I want to offer to you all is the power of this, I hope, in seeing our conflicts today as conflicts of lonely people. And I think there's some beauty in that. That the beauty of understanding that we're flawed human beings in a flawed environment in which we're simply not wired for. And when we begin to start to shift our lens and shift our thinking, it starts to open us up to what's possible and what could happen. But going back to that, in spite of this, in spite of the warnings of Hannah Arendt all those years ago, we continue to choose frictionless interaction. More and more and more, we make things frictionless. Amazon has now cashierless stores where you can go in and not see a single human being, go in, grab your stuff, and walk out the door. Amazon Go. More and more and more, if we can turn it into frictionless, meaning not having to deal with pesky human beings, we do. But is that what's best? Is that what we want? This beautiful thing from the book by Harvard psychologist, a general theory of love, a good deal of modern American culture is an extended experiment in depriving people of what they crave most. And I like to look at it this way, is I think our loneliness is a craving we can't quite put our finger on. So we fill it. We fill it as, these, as our great consumerist society allows us to do. Here's a little more perspective on that. Peter Slater writing in 1970, he says these beautiful lines here. He says that we seek a private house, a private means of transportation, a private garden, private everything. There's enormous technology that seems to have everything about making these tasks unnecessary for humans to get together. And he lends with that point when he says, we seek more and more privacy and feel more and more alienated and lonely when we get it. So will we continue down this path? What will the choice be for all of us? This is Zaina. I was 12 years old. All I remember is the shouting, and I see my uncle killed, that's all, and my mother screaming. I met Zaina in the home she shares with her parents, and she told me this story. As I mentioned to you earlier in this talk, the way I work is I usually do long, extensive interviews, and I um, glean from them some sort of humanity, what I feel is sort of a distilled piece of humanity. 
What was different about my talk with Zina is this is the entirety of what she said over the course of a half hour. Zina had been a very loquacious, vivacious young woman. Uh, she was the talk of her neighborhood, but when she experienced this trauma, she became a very quiet young woman who found it very, very difficult to talk. But as a professional, in interviewing people, as a professional storyteller, this left me with a bit of conundrum, and not to mention a, a bit of a sense of failure, that I had walked away from this encounter with only those words. She had actually been incredibly brave and incredibly generous to share those words with me, but I left thinking that I blew it and that I didn't know and didn't have what I needed. Until I got a partway out to the car, and I realized that this stranger, this young woman, very different than me, had actually told me and taught me the greatest lesson of all. And it's all in that last line. And my mother screaming. I realized in that line that I knew everything that I needed to know. I didn't need to know anything else. And the reason is that that line connected with me got through my spine like a shock. Because when I was Zina's age, one day my dad didn't come home. And we didn't know where he was, and we searched and searched for him. We searched for hours, and we couldn't find him anywhere. We called the highway patrol, we called the sheriff, we called his employer. Um, and day became night, night became early morning, we had no sense of where he might be. Um, we got so desperate that we got out a phone book when they used to have those things. And uh, we literally went through the phone book and we knew one last name of one person my father worked with. We went through there, we picked at random and called the number at three o'clock in the morning. And the person that answered was in fact the person who knew my father. And he agreed to go to the, uh, my dad had taken a job in another city and we were gonna be moving there to catch the family up when we finished school. And he agreed to go to the apartment to try to find my father. And in the ensuing hours, we waited and waited and hoped and hoped. And eventually we got the call that we hoped we would never get, that they had found my father and he was dead. And my mother screamed. She screamed so loud that I'll never forget it. And in that moment, a young woman from Baghdad and a middle-aged man in Minnesota became one. That we had this shared experience that told us about life, about our life together. What we had was a moment of empathy. Empathy comes from, in the, it comes from a word in criticism, in art criticism, a German word meaning feeling into. That empathy is an active process of feeling into and, and transmitting and receiving the meaning of something. So when you encounter a piece of work of art, that you're both gleaning the intent of the creator and you're adding your own experience into that into a mutual, a mutual meaning making that we call empathy. And of course, what Zina presents and presents for this discussion is the empathy for the stranger. That we are naturally empathetic for the people in our immediate circle. We're naturally empathetic for our family and for our friends. But what Zina taught me and I hope teaches all of us is the empathy for the stranger. That when you realize that common connection of shared experience, the world becomes bigger. You engage what I call the empathetic imagination. And when you engage your empathetic imagination, you're engaging in shared experience. Shared experience of all. And when you do that, you shift to understanding. And when you're understanding at the wider level, you're expanding your identity. And when you're expanding your identity, you're enabling and allowing for reason to come in. 
that singular identity that we go through navigating the world, trying to be right and trying to survive and trying to make sense of the groups and employers and bosses and family members and friends that we do every day, when that circle becomes bigger, our understanding becomes bigger. The more people we understand, the more we understand. And in that way, that identity quiets down and reason begins to flourish. The great African novelist Chinua Achebe, I think, says this well when he says, the imagination, we lack imagination. If we had enough imagination to put ourselves in the stress of, in the shoes of the person we oppress, things would begin to happen. We can imagine. Let us imagine. This is Zay. Zay lives in the Englewood neighborhood of Chicago, at the near south side. I live in Streeterville. The average life expectancy of someone in Streeterville is 90 years old. The average life expectancy of someone in Englewood is 60. As the NYU study found, that the distinction between Streeterville and, and Englewood is the largest disparity in the United States. If you grow up and live in Englewood, on average, you will leave, live 30 years less than if you live in Streeterville. We walked through his neighborhood, and as we walked about, it was common to come across sidewalks that were crumbled and in, you know, and unrepaired. And as we talked, we would point out the fact that that sidewalk was like that when he was a kid, and it hasn't changed. That for many struggling neighborhoods, the small businesses have moved out, the small businesses have struggled, uh, the schools have closed. The life there is very different. My children, when they went on their eighth grade trip, they went to Washington, D.C. When he went on his eighth grade trip, they went to the county jail for a scared straight program. As we walked through the neighborhoods and we came around the corner and to, went on to a nice tree-lined street, we came across a beautiful, beautiful new building. Modern architecture, tall, clean, fresh asphalt with gated parking, which is like Nirvana in Chicago. And it was this beautiful building in the heart of Englewood. And he points to it and says, that's the police station. The best building in Englewood is the police station. And then he looks at me and winks and says, defund the police. Now, as we all know, defund the police, it's probably one of the worst political lines ever. But when you sit with a man in his neighborhood, as it crumbles to the ground and the police station rises, you can understand what he's saying. Think of all the ways that defund the police gets used. Think of the weaponization of that term. Think of the weaponization of that term. Think of what it is to be pilloried with that term. But for Zay, for us, living in empathetic imagination, it has meaning. Don't ever listen to the weaponization of language again. Talk to people. Talk to people. If you want the truth, talk to people and listen. One of the most, I believe, unrecorded aspects of the COVID, of the COVID uh, pandemic is that it kept us away from strangers. 
the average person encounters 11 to 16 strangers a day. The person you buy your paper from, when you get something at the pharmacy, the people you cross in an intersection. We come across strangers every day. And for almost two years, many of us never encountered a stranger. All the research is clear that those weak tie, what are considered weak tie strangers, have huge impacts. The psychological impact of the weak tie stranger is enormous for mental health and physical health. And for two years, we had almost no interaction with strangers. But I believe that's one of the most important things that we're still circling through and coming out of, is how we re-engage that. And so what I'm putting forth to us today is the way we get back from our loneliness is through strangers. The way we get back from loneliness is through the thing we fear most, the stranger. So back in Chicago, I was really worried about the young man who now really made his uh, presence known in our neighborhood. And I started, because I was a little worried about him, I would see him, and whenever I saw him, I would make eye contact and I would nod. And those nods kind of progressed to a hello. He, he didn't really have the facility to be able to respond to me, but I wanted to just reach out as often as I could whenever I passed him and I would say hello. And he, he usually wouldn't respond. And so then one day I was, co I was uh, going along, we both came, were at an intersection to cross over at the same time. And I turned to him and I said, how are you today? And he looked at me and beamed. And he said, I'm having a great day. And I was like, I feel terrific. Thank you. It made me feel so good. Because I don't know about you all, but you know, the, the great days are kind of hard to come by. We're thinking about a lot of things with COVID and the stress, and we got to do this, and we got to do that. And here he was. I'm having a great day. And he reached in his pocket and he pulled out his wallet and he said, can I give you my card? And I said, sure. And he took out his card, which was a uh, ruled, lined ruled notebook paper. And written in pencil was KS312850 dot dot dot. And he gave me his card. And off we went. Humans. What people do for us, what others do for us, is they introduce us to things we could not have imagined ourselves. They introduce us to things we could not have imagined ourselves. The story I use to support this is the story of becoming a parent. When I was younger, I had this idea of wanting to be a parent. I really wanted to be a parent. I aspired to be a parent. I had a vision of being a parent. And my vision of being a parent was basically father knows best set to harps music. <laughs> that I was going to stand in front of my children and I would regale them with my wisdom and they would bathe me in harps music. <laughs> and that that was what it was to be a parent. Of course it was. And I wanted to be a parent. I was kind of a long time bachelor and then I eventually became a parent and then I realized what parenting, well, actually was, which I describe as being attacked by bees while driving. <laughs> so what I thought I knew turned out not to be very true. But those strangers that live with me, by the way, they're now teenagers, so I have an addendum to that story, which is now, we actually run a we run a B and B for the world's worst guests. <laughs> but they, of course, they taught me what I never could have imagined myself. That I would love them, and that I would find in myself ways to change myself because of what they need. That they taught me about what it was to be a person on this planet 
and what it was to be in actual relationship in a way that I never could have imagined. Father Knows Best set the harps music would have sucked. <laughs> but I didn't know that until I got involved with those strangers. And of course, this is enshrined in our collective wisdom. I read the Good Samaritan parable particularly from the perspective of the fact that it is the Samaritan who is the example of what to do. The other is the example of what to do, that we find the wisdom in the other. Of course, Stuart, John Stuart Mill famously talked about this as well when he says that you, know, you can't overestimate the value of putting human beings in contact with persons different from themselves. We know this, we've talked about this in this conference, that diversity makes us stronger. The other makes us stronger and smarter because we simply cannot perceive enough on our own to thrive. We simply cannot perceive enough on our own to thrive. We don't know much. We're social. And the greater we expand that sociability, the greater we expand that social connection, the more we thrive. The more insular we are, the more self-assured we are, the more disconnected we are, the less we thrive. And interestingly and fascinating, two, 20, two studies from 2021 that talking to strangers provides a greater increase in subjective well-being than talking to with family and friends. Why? Because it helps us grow and thrive. That it expands our identity and reduces loneliness. And I think all of you have experienced this. When you have that great conversation with someone you've never met, and you find that instant connection, doesn't it feel great? It's like every wire in your brain just lit on fire. It expands our identity and decreases loneliness. It's the means by which we reach our full human potential, both as individuals and as a society. For me, this links so directly into Martin Luther King's comments when he says that whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. This is the interrelated structure of reality. We learn from each other. We depend on each other. We can't be who we are without each other. The other. So by this time, KS and I have a nice little bond. We don't really know each other, but we say hello to each other. KS is clearly struggling. Um, I find him wandering in the streets a lot. Fortunately, recently, he had discovered the tennis courts at the park, and he would go and stand in front of the tennis courts and stare at the tennis players playing tennis for hours. Other times, he would stare and look at the trees for hours. It was better than wandering in the intersection. I felt much better. And whenever I would see him, if I could, I would say hello. He usually responded blankly and said, oh, hi. Like, he knew he was supposed to know me, but it was pretty clear that he didn't. But it was okay, because when I ever asked him, how are you doing today? He would say, I'm having a great day. And it made me feel good. I look forward to seeing him. And I would go by and I would say out on the sidewalk, sometimes maybe a little bit louder so certain people could hear me with Bichon freezes. I'd say, hi, KS. And KS would nod back and those Bichon freeze walkers were just, what is going on? <laughs> so I have a proposal. And like all my ideas, it starts with a story. And then I'll get to my point. This is Muhammad. And this is Muhammad's story. When I was growing up and going to school, my father would say goodbye every day, not knowing if I would make it back home. 
and my graduation ceremony from medical school at Terrors blew himself up. The force knocked me down, a schoolmate lost his eyes, I wrapped my shirt around his head and held him. As often happens in war-torn areas that I've covered, I've covered uh, several conflict zones, parents have to make an impossible choice, whether to send their children to school or keep them home and safe, or hopefully safer. Imagine having to make the choice between your parents, your child's education and their safety. And his parents decided that they would send him to school. So every day, his father would hug him goodbye as if he would never see him again. Imagine. Every day, through grade school, through high school, through college, and through medical school, he would hug him goodbye as if he would never see him again. And Muhammad gets to the very last day of medical school, the pinnacle for every sacrifice his parents have ever made. And in the course of the ceremony itself, a terrorist got in and blew himself up, killing many students, wounding students, maiming students. Students whose parents made the same calculation as his own. Students, who made the students whose parents made the decision to send them to school only to get to the end and have it destroyed. And what does Muhammad do? Muhammad doesn't run for the door. He doesn't cower and cover. He reaches for his friend who will now never be a physician, and holds him. And holds him. We need to hold on to the communities and connections that we have. We need to restore those communities. We need to find those connections, particularly the people that aren't like us. And to do that, we have to begin to dismantle the assumptions that keep us apart. When it comes to it, the primary cultural idea held by most people, at least in practice, is that other people you don't know cannot be trusted. It's the famous Hobbes-Rousseau conflict, if you're familiar with that in, in philosophy whether men are naturally good or whether men are self-interested and selfish. And I think the research, again, tells us a much more hopeful picture that in total, human beings are good. And it's actually our experience that we have every day. We navigate the most precarious things every day without even thinking about it because we're good, because we cooperate. I make a living going around and talking to strangers who I've never met. I've never had a bad experience. But we don't act that way. We may need to begin to dismantle those assumptions, begin to reconsider how we consider other. And I would like to propose that we adopt this, that we adopt an ethic, a practice of purposeful connection. Imagine living a life oriented every minute of every hour of every day to purposeful connection. When you walk out the door, do you nod to your neighbor? When you see someone in need, do you look? Do you engage even a distant connection? What kind of company are you creating? What kind of decisions are you making around efficiency? How would those decisions be different if the priority was purposeful connection? How do you eat dinner? How do you stay in touch with friends? Do you only text? Purposeful connection. Imagine a world of purposeful connection. Amazon Go has its purpose. If you really have to get home 
quick, and your wife's been with the kids all day, go to Amazon Go. But should we go there every day? So what I'm proposing is an ethical practice. That human connection has value in itself. It has value worth maintaining. And the reason for that, and the ethical foundation for that, is we cannot be free alone. We want to be, but we can't. To be truly alone would require having a personal army and fences and all the types of things that we often want by the choice of where we live. But are we free? Are we free when the stranger comes? Are we free when we hear the story of those people, those people? Are we free in terms of the financial choices we make that we need to make in order to maintain that? That freedom only becomes an engagement and relationship with other. And in that relationship with other, we become truly free. And the other thing that I would like to say is this. Our indifference is not neutral. Our indifference is never neutral. Your indifference spreads. Your indifference has impact. And every time we disconnect, every time we create loneliness, we are decreasing the possibilities for another human being somewhere in that network because we're connected and it matters. There is no such thing as something not affecting other people because indifference is not neutral. As we said earlier, social connection, we are social animals, has one of the most profound health consequences of all. So, about a week and a half ago, I was out in the neighborhood again, I was talking to KS as much as that's possible, just nodding and saying a few words. And there was a neighbor from the building nearby, and he saw me talking to KS. Once again, he was a little bit taken aback, and he, he stood off to the side until we were finished. And he came over to me, and he said, do you know what happened to him? And I said, no, I, no, I don't, and uh, I, not at all. And he said, well, I'll tell you. As a young man, he was shot in the head by a gang drive-by shooting. He was a good kid who lost it all. He was a good kid who lost it all. The person we feared was the victim. The person we thought might victimize us was the victim. He was the victim. So why is all this important? Why do we do this as a society? Why do we do this as companies? Why do we do this as individuals? Because the fundamental element of life is that we don't know where greatness will come from. We don't know who or what will touch us with greatness. And we cannot and should not cut ourselves off from that. And this is exhibit one. I've been using this for some time, but it's one of my favorite stories of all time. This is Tanatuala Arwami. And as you can see here, he was the 2019 New York State Chess Champion, which is a phenomenal accomplishment by anyone if you know anything about New York chess. New York chess, kids have start young, they have tutors, 
Their parents invest enormous amounts of money. But this story was a little different because he was a homeless boy from Nigeria living in a homeless shelter. His father would make just enough money to scrap by by renting a U Uber, driving around, getting people. Oh, he'd rent a car and make it an Uber, drive around, pay off the rental, and whatever scraps they had left, that's what they lived off of. That's what they ate off of. And they lived in a homeless shelter. But he, on his own, taught himself chess. And he was in a public school with a chess teacher. And he, as the teacher said, worked. And he worked harder than any other student, harder than any person of his age, in, as people say, in all of New York City. And in 2019, he was the New York State chess champion for his age group. We don't know where greatness comes from. How many kids have we left behind in homeless shelters? How many chess champions have we left behind? How many cures for cancer have we left behind? Because we don't know where greatness will come from. I'll leave you or begin to wrap this up with one final story. This is Muhammad. For 21 years, I lived with my family in a one-room tent in Djibouti. Very bad conditions, no running water, robberies, wild animals. My dream was to get a high school education, and I had to sneak into Ethiopia each year to go to school. It was easy to feel hopeless, but even if you can't see hope, you don't have to be hopeless. Even if you can't see hope, you don't have to be hopeless. Let's remind ourselves what it looks like to live in a tent for 21 years. Muhammad always wanted an education. It was his big dream. He wanted to get a high school education. So he would hop a train, go across the border, sneak into school, in elementary school, and then sneak back after the school season to the refugee camp. And he did this year after year at terrible peril. Um, they would climb on trains. You've probably seen it. They, they hide on the roof or they hide between cars. It's very, very dangerous. He fell off multiple times. He has a lifelong injury to his arm. Uh, but he dreamed of a high school education to do anything he could. And year after year, he went across and got his education. But in America, the majority of Americans right now feel that life will be worse in this country in 2050. In fact, a study released a couple weeks ago said that the majority of people are more fearful than hopeful. That we as a country have become more fearful than hopeful. And this isn't just Pollyannish stuff when we're talking about hope. Václav Havel, the famous activist, first president of the Czech Republic, believed mightily in hope as the practical human application. He felt that it was the balance between optimism and pessimism, that both of those were too far on either side to be useful, but that hope was something more Hope is something more consequential. As he said, hope is a feeling that life and work have meaning. And regardless of the state of the world that surrounds you, hope. Muhammad had hope. Muhammad has hope. But importantly, the hope of others is what defines what's possible for us all. That if a person near me has less hope, so too do I. When I encounter a person who has more hope, so too do I. 
It is impossible to disconnect from the hope or hopelessness of others. That we share hope. It's what connects us all. What is this thing we talk about called human connection? It's hope. It's hope. When we're together, we have hope. When we're not, we don't. When one person has hope, I have hope. When another person doesn't, neither do I. And so often, in this calculation, we miscalculate. The people we need are often the people we reject. The Muhammads. I need Muhammad's hope. Muhammad makes me better. And of course, so does our chess prodigy family. This photo is taken uh, several weeks after the chess championship, the Ottawami family, pictured here on the bed. When he won the chess championship, you can imagine it was a cause celeb. It was quite a sensation to the point that they got numerous offers. Numerous offers for a private school, numerous offers for what was described as palatial housing in Manhattan, uh, numerous offers for chess scholarships, uh, numerous offers for a job for their father. But they did something interesting. They didn't accept any of it. And the reason is that instead, they got a small little apartment. They took that. They took the money they were offered, and they created a fund for Nigerian refugees. The apartment allowed them to stay close to the school. They gave their son a chance to be a chess champion, and they wanted to be loyal to the school. And so they took that largesse, and they turned it around, and they gave it away. They gave it away. We don't know where greatness will come from. Their hope, their trust, their faith ennobles mine. As Nelson Mandela said, our human compassion binds us one to the other, not in pity or patronizingly, but as human beings who have learned how to turn our common suffering into hope for the future. Why do I study people on the margins? Why do I listen to people on the margins? Because they teach me hope. They teach me to be human. That we're all stories in progress written in our shared hope. We were this, as we've discussed, we were wired to be these perfect tribal machines, highly manipulable, vulnerable to persuasion. But there was one poetic flaw that deep in that DNA, deep in that DNA was a flawed tribal machine. And that flaw in the code is that we need each other to thrive. We need each other to thrive. And that flaw brings us back to each other again and again and again. And as Mother Teresa said, we have no, if we have no peace, it is because we have forgotten that we belong to each other. That I belong. That you belong. That we belong. To each other. I've spent my career in a journey of search for human connection. And I've been lucky to be able to meet and learn from the people along the way. 
that I haven't learned very much on my own, but I've learned from the shared stories and the shared wisdom that people have given me, that their experience teaches me everything I know. I think Hannah Arendt summed this process up in a really profound way that I'd like to leave us with today. When she said, the world is not humane because it is made by human beings and it has not become humane just because the human voice sounds in it, but only when it has become the object of discourse. We humanize what is going on in the world and in ourselves only by speaking of it, and in the course of speaking of it, we learn to be human. I love that idea, that we learn to be human, that we are all of us together in this long-term venture, this long-term process of learning to be human. There's nothing that we're experiencing today as a society and individuals that has, not been, that has not been experienced before. But history tells us that if we don't tend to these connections, the option is disaster. That when we find each other, greatness is possible. When we don't, disaster follows. And so, I want to leave us with this little bit. Before I came up here last week, I was walking down the street and I saw chaos in the distance. And where chaos is usually walking towards me absently, I saw him looking at me and he was looking at me from a distance and I could feel it. And then as he got closer, tentatively, just so tentatively, his hand was kind of shaking. He got up and he waved. He waved. And he had a smile on his face that he made connection. He connected with somebody and he smiled. And so did I. And so did I. Let us cast off these chains that keep us apart. Let's set our sights for that distant shore that's possible. And let us learn to be human again together. Thank you.